The concept of atoms was first proposed by the Greek philosophers in the 5th century. The concept of atoms was first proposed by Greek philosophers, um, namely Democritus, and he even came up with the term atoms. What he proposed was that the only things that really existed are in our entire universe were atoms and the void. So he said that the entire universe consists of tiny particles that are indivisible and the void, which we would now call space. So incredibly enough, they, they, he was pretty much right on. Um, and this was, you know, I think in, uh, yeah, 5th century BC. So uh, atoms and space was a pretty accurate uh, description of, of the universe that we live in. Um, after that, people kind of started making guesses that weren't quite so good. So Aristotle um, and a lot of the, most of the people who came after him because Aristotle was so influential, they thought that um, most matter consisted of um, four elements. There were only four things, fire, earth, air, and water, and they were mixed together in different proportions to make all of the different substances we see. Um, and it wasn't until 1807 that an English school teacher, John Dalton, um, came up with an idea that was pretty similar to what Democritus had proposed more than 2,000 years earlier. So his atomic theory is uh, basically that there were five postulates to his, um, to his theory here. And one, he said that matter, uh, all, the, all of the things that we can touch, so all, all matter, is composed of small particles called atoms, and an atom is the smallest unit of an element that can participate in a chemical change. Um, in the second postulate, an element consists of only one type of atom, which has a mass that is characteristic of the element and is the same for all atoms of that element. So there's only one type of atom in an element, and they, all of those atoms have the same mass. So here's an example of what those atoms might look like in a copper penny. All of those spheres, all the copper atoms, if we had a microscope, that would really, really powerful microscope, and we could zoom really f close into that penny, this is kind of what it would look like. A bunch of atoms, a bunch of spherical atoms all smashed together. So the third postulate is that atoms of one element differ in properties from atoms of all other elements. So this, in this way, you can tell them apart, right? So if atoms of, of different elements were had the same properties, it would be difficult to tell them apart. So Atoms have their own unique properties. Um, the fourth postulate, a compound consists of atoms of two or more elements combined in small whole number ratio. In a given compound, the number of atoms of each of its elements are always present in the same ratio. So uh, he envisioned atoms as these small particles and that the particles could stick together, stick to particles of other elements, atoms of other elements to make compounds. And when they did that, the compound had unique properties, like the, the atoms and the elements themselves had unique properties, and those, um, therefore, all of the particles, all of the, every time they, uh, every time a compound reacted, it must have the same arrangement of atoms as all the other ones, if they had the same chemical and physical properties. Um, and five, atoms are neither created nor destroyed during a chemical change. They just, uh, kind of move around and change partners. They rearrange to yield a different type of matter. So we saw these copper, copper atoms in this penny. Well, if uh, copper is oxidized um, in, the, uh, in, um, oxi in oxygen and water, in the presence of oxygen and water, then copper will turn into copper oxide. Uh, and those oxygen atoms, the red atoms, kind of move in between the copper atoms. So this would be an example of a chemical change, a chemical reaction, where uh, the, the atoms themselves are not destroyed, and they uh, don't transform into other atoms, 
but they kind of trade places and they kind of take different shapes when other atoms can fit in between them. So this, this is an example of uh, kind of what Dalton was talking about here when he said that um, in a chemical reaction, the atoms just kind of rearrange themselves. So um, the law of conservation of matter that, ma that mass matter could neither be created nor destroyed had been proposed earlier uh, before Dalton's theory. And this theory, the law of the conservation of matter, came from the results of experiments where um, very, uh, very precise balances were used to measure the mass of a chemical system before and after a chemical reaction. So for example, they would have um, a, uh, uh, some kind of material, maybe a rock or some kind of ore in a enclosed jar, and they could use maybe the light from a magnifying glass or something to heat up that rock very hot until it started to have a chemical reaction. Um, maybe reacting with the oxygen inside of the jar or something inside of the closed jar until a chemical reaction occurred. And though it was obvious that a chemical reaction had occurred because things looked different and maybe there was now a gas floating around, the, the mass of the, of the balance didn't change. And so they became convinced that although the, the particles inside there can change places and turn into different compounds and the solids can turn into gases and vice versa, they were not... Uh, losing any mass and they were not uh, creating new atoms and the atoms themselves were getting destroyed they were just kind of trading partners so the law of definite proportions was um, uh, kind of a kind of took Dalton's theory one step further where Dalton's theory said um, atoms in a compound are always arranged the same way um, this law of definite, propor definite proportions said that uh, no matter how much of a sample you took, you could take um, different quantities of a pure compound and the mass ratio of one atom to another atom in, uh, in different samples that weighed a different amount was always constant. So this, you know, we've, we've talked about heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. This was really another way of saying that the compounds and the atoms in the compounds were homogeneous and they different molecules of the same compound didn't have a different quantity of atoms because that would give it a different uh, chemical property and different physical properties. Um, and the law of multiple proportions said that when there are two different compounds, sometimes they would mix elements together and they would um, create compounds when they would just mix the two elements together. But sometimes they'd create more than one compound, different kinds of compounds. So in that case, whenever there was more than one compound created when they mixed two elements together, those, um, uh, the mass ratio of the atoms that were in the different compounds always came out to be a whole number. So that was pointing to, the, to what we now know, which is that I can have a compound with copper and chloride that's CuCl, one copper and one chloride, and I can have a compound with copper and chloride that's CuCl2, one copper and two chloride. So every if I'm going to have a different compound with copper and chloride, there's only a couple of possibilities. I can have one copper and one chloride. I can have one copper and two chlorides. I could have two coppers and two chlorides, or two coppers and one chloride. Whatever the combination might be of that new compound, it has to be a whole number multiple of those elements. I can't have one and a half coppers and one chlorine because the coppers can't break in half. So this, them finding that the, the ratio of the, the mass ratio of the two compounds always came to a whole number was kind of pointing them in this direction that... Um, the atoms were these discrete units that could 
um, combine in different ratios to create different compounds. So we now know, for example, here's the crystal structure of a couple of different um, compounds containing both copper and chlorine. So under the right conditions, maybe in, before they knew what it was, they were creating this compound. And um, under different conditions with copper and oxygen, maybe a different heat or more oxygen or something, maybe they were creating this compound. Um, so the, the difference here in these compounds is, um, if we count the atoms here, the, count the brown ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the green ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then the brown ones, there's another eight, and then the green ones, there's another eight, so this is a one-to-one -one ratio of, of copper to chlorine. And here, this is one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four. So this is a two-to-one ratio of chlorine to copper. So what makes these two compounds different is not the kinds of atoms that are in there. They have copper atoms, the brown ones, and chlorine atoms, the green ones. They both do. And they both even have four chlorine atoms attached to a copper atom like this. But what makes them different is that they have a different bond, bond angles. And they're, these coppers are bonded to each other in a way that they're not over here. So those different shapes lead to different ratios. And they lead to different chemical properties like being green or being brown. And they probably have different melting points. And they probably have different uh, chemical properties.